It is a fact that the sacred narratives described in the Quran, such as the story of the flood at the time of Nuh السلام, the story of uh, Joseph, Yusuf السلام, uh, the story of the exodus um, from Egypt, the hijrah of Musa السلام, with the Bani Israel, the Quranic versions of these narratives make much more historical sense than their biblical counterparts. In other words, the flood and the exodus as described in the Bible are basically historically impossible, or at least highly implausible. Somehow, the Quran avoided many of the problematic historical claims of the biblical authors. And this is from the Dala'il and nubuwa This is one of the proofs of prophecy. This is a proof that the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was a true Nabi, a true prophet. For example, I'll give you an example. The Bible says that 600,000 men of fighting age made exodus from Egypt with Musa alayhi salam. This means about 3 million people made exodus from Egypt. If we count the women, the children, the elderly, not to mention animals, 3 million people plus livestock. Historically, this is almost falsifiable. This would mean that basically a third of the entire population of Egypt made hijrah. This would have been noticed by other civilizations in that region, yet no one recorded it. Three million people for 40 years would have left a major footprint in the Sinai Desert. There is none. If three million people were marching, just to give you a visual, or to conceptualize this a little bit, if three million people were marching, 10 men across, when the first row reached Mount Sinai, the last row would have still, still been in Egypt. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran? The exodus is confirmed in its general sense in the Quran, but there are changes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes to the narrative that are extremely important and often overlooked by even scholars, let alone average readers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa awha, wa ila Musa an asli bi We reveal to Musa alayhi salam, journey under the cover of night with my servants. Indeed, you will be pursued. So they all left in one night. And Fir'aun, Pharaoh sent summoners to the cities. Saying these people are a small remnant. A small remnant, according to the Quran, a small group of believers in Allah and His Messenger Musa السلام, made hijrah, made the exodus. How many Sahaba made hijrah from Mecca to Medina during the time of the Prophet It was a small group. The biblical version of the Exodus cannot be true historically, while the Quranic version is very plausible. If the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ plagiarized the Bible, which is the standard Quranic, the standard Afwan, the standard Orientalist trope that he plagiarized the Bible in the Quran, then they say this even to this day. Why didn't he copy these problems? How did he know to make this adjustment to the narrative? How did the Prophet ﷺ in quotes know that the rulers of Egypt at the time of Yusuf ﷺ were called muluk? They were called kings, not pharaohs. The ruler at the time of Musa ﷺ was called Fir'aun, was called Pharaoh. The Quran is correct historically. The book of Genesis gets it wrong. Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ call the ruler, why didn't the Prophet again in quotes, call the ruler of Egypt at the time of Yusuf ﷺ a pharaoh like the Bible did? How did he know to make this adjustment to the narrative? How did he know to avoid this, uh, this anachronism? It's called an anachronism. <clears throat> there are linguistic subtleties in the Quran that the Prophet ﷺ could not have known. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Katha ya ain saad, dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu Zakariya. The name Zakariya in Hebrew means the mention of the Lord. This is what it, his name, Zakaria, in Hebrew means the mention of the Lord. So this verse is a play on words. Dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu Zakaria. The mention of the mercy of your Lord to his servant, the mention of the Lord. This is, there's this beautiful, subtle symmetry in this one ayah. The author of this ayah knew Hebrew. There's no doubt about it. If a Jew living in the Hijaz heard this verse, his ears would perk up. He would notice the subtlety. Another example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمْرَأَتُهُ قَائِمَةً فَطَحِكَتْ فَبَشَّرْنَاهَ بِإِسْحَاقِ That the wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam, she laughed, and then we gave her glad tidings of Isaac. Isaac means laughter. And then it says, وَمِنْ وَرَائِهِ is وَمِنْ وَمِنْ وَرَائِ إِسْحَاقَ يَعْقُوبِ وَمِنْ وَرَائِ إِسْحَاقَ يَعْقُوبِ And then following Isaac, Jacob. The name Isaac means laughter in Hebrew. The name Jacob means to follow or to come after. 
This is a type of wordplay that adds to the eloquence and brilliance of the Quran. Whoever composed this verse knew Hebrew. Of course, we know this is a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll give you another example. There's, there's hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of these types of examples. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Yahya alayhi salam, وَحَنَانَ مِنْ لَدُونَ وَزَكَاتًا وَكَانَ تَقِيَّا Now Yahya is John, John the Baptist, peace be upon him, most probably. The Quran calls him Yahya, meaning he lives because he was martyred. And the martyrs are alive. بَلْ أَحْيَا عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ They're alive with their Lord, receiving sustenance from their Lord. But the Hebrew name of John is Yohanan, which is related to Hananan. وَحَنَانَ مِنْ لَدُونَ وَزَكَاتًا وَكَانَ تَقِيَّا This is the only occurrence of this word in the entire Qur'an. And it's describing Yahya alayhi salam because it actually relates to his historical name. These are subtleties that go over the head of 99% of the Qur'an's readers. The author of the Qur'an is playing with these languages in a masterful way. Now we also believe in miracles, mu'jizat. Musa alayhi salam performed many miracles. The idhnillah and secular historians do not consider miracles when determining what happened in history. That's part of our iman bil ghayb, right? Because the past is ghayb. We don't have access to it. We can't reproduce these things. Our belief in miracles is not irrational, nor is it falsifiable. It is based upon our belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can argue rationally that this universe had a designer and a creator. And that this creator is personal. This is why there is something rather than nothing. This is a big philosophical conundrum for these philosophers. Why is there something rather than nothing? This creator who brought this universe into existence from nothing has power over every atom in the universe. Miracles are easy for him. But this is a philosophical argument. This is a theological argument. But from a standpoint of history, the Quran's narratives avoid the historical pitfalls of the biblical narratives. And I would say this is also true of the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, our master Isa alayhi salam. When the Quran's Christology, its statements about Christ, even though, so, so, so the Quran's Christology make more historical sense than what the New Testament even teaches about Jesus, peace be upon him, even though the Quran came 500 years after the New Testament. This is amazing. Most historians today do not believe that the historical Jesus, peace be upon him, claimed to be divine. They say he claimed to be a prophet and a healer who taught a more relaxed interpretation of the Torah and that he spoke of someone to come after him who would bring the kingdom of God on earth. And when it comes to the crucifixion, so here the Christian will point, will point out to the Muslim and say, look, here the historian says, Isa alayhi salam was crucified, but the Quran denies it. But here I would say, that historians have highly overemphasized the historicity of the crucifixion. I think if they look closely at the evidence again, many of them will affirm at least the historical plausibility that Isa alayhi salam was not crucified. What does the Quran say? It says those who differed about it, meaning the crucifixion, were in doubt and shak concerning it. They did not have certain knowledge. They did not have ilm, except that they followed dhan, conjecture. In other words, none of the evidence that Jews and Christians marshal to support Jesus' crucifixion, none of it was written by an eyewitness of this alleged historical event. Every epistle, every gospel, every statement in Christian, Jewish, and Roman sources, without exception, came much later and were authored by people who were not there. Paul was the first person in recorded history to claim that Jesus was crucified. This was 20 years later. After, he, after the alleged event, and he wasn't even there. Paul never met the historical Jesus. He was not a disciple. So these sources are conjectural. They are dhanni. Today, we know that this is true. The Quran is correct. But back when the Prophet ﷺ first ordered the, uttered these words, Christians and historians believed that the four Gospels, that two of them were written by two disciples of Jesus, and the other two were written by disciples of disciples. No historian really believes that anymore. The Quran is correct, yet most historians continue to drag their feet on this issue. There's a dogmatism among even secular historians. Don't think these people are objective. Put, put, put 50 quote-unquote uh, objective secular historians in a room and, and give them a topic. You have 50 different responses, 50 different opinions. 
So allow me to paraphrase an excellent point made by Dr. Louis Fatouhi. This is what he says. It's a paraphrase. He says, if the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is the real author of the Quran, and he desperately hoped to convert Jews and Christians to Islam and to become his followers, then why in the world did he deny the crucifixion of Jesus when both Jews and Christians maintained that he was crucified? Why would he invent an uncrucified Jesus? Why would he create an unnecessary barrier to, con to uh, conversion? The answer seems to be that the Quran is stating an actual fact since it has direct access to history as a divine revelation. It is simply a fact that Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary, peace be upon them, was not crucified. So here's the main point. The Quran's version of the flood, the exodus, the story of Joseph, the teachings of Jesus are more historically accurate than what the Bible says.